Sergeant Biondo, please start your recording. Uh, one moment, Chief, and just making sure the live stream is on. Thank you. Yes, we're up and rolling. Um, according to the computer has begun. Recording to the cloud is rolling and so is the backup. I will start with the opening. Good morning. Welcome to the New York City Council's remote committee hearing on immigration jointly with the Committee on Veterans. Everyone, please turn on your video at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chairman Chaka, we're ready to begin. Buenos dias, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Carlos Menchaca, and I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. We are joined today by, uh, for the first time ever, um, the Committee on Veterans, chaired by my colleague and friend, Councilmember Eric Dinowitz. I'd like to acknowledge the members that are here today. Uh, we'll be acknowledging you throughout the course of the hearing, but as of now, we are joined by council members, um, Ampri Samuel, Kim, and Maisel. We are really, uh, Chin, sorry. Uh, we are really, really excited that uh, the members of both committees are here today to discuss a very important conversation. You know, as we so often do in the immigration committee, I wanna focus in on a subset of immigrant population, immigrant neighbors, immigrant New Yorkers, that are particularly vulnerable and discuss what unique issues they are facing here in our city so that we can ensure that their concerns are heard by our administration and discuss how we as a city can improve access to city services. Today, we'd like to discuss foreign born members of the United States Armed Forces. Immigrants have long enlisted in all branches of the US military, beginning with the Revolutionary War. Immigrants represented half of all military recruits by the 1840s and 20% of the 1.5 million service members in the Union Army during the Civil War. Today, the number of veterans who were born outside the United States stand at approximately 530,000, representing 3% of all 18.6 million veterans nationwide. Additionally, almost 1.9 million veterans are the US born children of immigrants, currently naturalized citizens, lawful permanent residents, and some Pacific Islanders are permitted to enlist uh, I want to give a shout out to all those who are listening who are veterans and thank you personally for your service. Uh, I especially want to thank my brother, uh, Abraham Menchaka, who served two tours, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, uh, and to all our brothers and sisters uh, and, and family members uh, who serve. Recognizing immigrants' honorable service in World War II Congress changed laws to make it easier for immigrants serving in the military to become naturalized citizens. This included policies such as authorizing immigration officials to naturalize members of the armed forces while they were overseas and expedited naturalization process, processes for non-citizens who served honorably in the armed forces after 9-11. The Bush and the Obama administrations further enhanced these policies, making it easier for non-citizens to join the armed forces and for them to receive expedited citizenship for their honorable service. However, the Trump administration attacked many of these policies, eliminated military naturalization resources, and created barriers to prevent expedited citizenship for service members. Unfortunately, some service members were even deported by the same nation they took an oath to defend. This is unacceptable. 
And thankfully, the Biden administration recently directed uh, USCIS, ICE, and CBP to immediately conduct a review of these barriers. And federal legislation was also introduced by Congress per to protect non-citizens, non-citizen veterans from deportation. However, much damage has been done. And due to all the barriers that the Trump administration put into place, there have been significant declines in the number of service members applying for and earning US citizenship through military service. In fact, the Military Times report reported a 65% decline in May of 2018. Furthermore, the rate of denial of military naturalization applications was significantly higher than the rate of denial for civilian naturalization applications. We owe it to our service members who put their lives on the line to protect our country and our well being to ensure that they are treated fairly and that they are able to access the benefits that they are entitled to. You know, I look forward to this hearing uh, from the administration. Uh, they will be testifying today about how we are serving our foreign born veterans and what more we can do to ensure that they have the resources they need to access the benefits that they deserve. Now, I'm grateful uh, to DBS and Moya for being present today and I'm hoping that we hear some commitments about how we can double down uh, utilizing the resources that we have currently and potentially new resources to address these unique needs. Now, uh, I wanna say thank you to the staff who put this together. Uh, they are behind the scenes and they are doing some incredible work as we wrap up the immigration work. Uh, this is not my last hearing, but we are final, uh, we're in the final stretch uh, and this committee staff has been incredible working around the clock. Committee Council Harbani Awusha, uh, as well as my Chief of Staff Lorena Lucero and Legislative Director Cesar Vargas. Uh, you're going to hear from him later today as well. Uh, he's been pretty central as someone who is part of the armed forces as well. Uh, I also want to thank the Veterans Committee staff, Council uh, Bianca Vitali, uh, Policy Analyst Elizabeth Arts. And with that, I want to hand it over to my co-chair for today. And again, it's this historic moment that we are bringing these two committees together. And I can't wait to be joining uh, uh, our ideas and thoughts uh, in this hearing. Chair Dinowitz. Thank you, Chair Menchak. I'm also looking forward to this hearing of this uh, very important topic. Uh, well, my name is Eric Dinowitz, Council Member from the Bronx and Chair of New York City Council's Committee on Veterans. Uh, I, I'd also like to just first recognize other Council Members who have joined us, uh, Council Member Brooks Powers, Council Member Drum, Council Member Moya, Council Member Felice, and Council Member Vallone. I wanna thank you all for joining us at today's hearing with the Committee on Immigration about city services for foreign born service members, veterans and military families. I also wanna extend a warm welcome to all of the service members, veterans and military families with us here today. Veterans Day is fast approaching and I wanna acknowledge that this is a day where we celebrate and honor all of America's veterans for their love of country and willingness to serve for the common good. The commitment of our foreign born service members represents extraordinary patriotism and our country should recognize this contribution by offering a clear path to citizenship. Uh, the service of immigrants in the United States military is an honored tradition dating back to the Revolutionary War. Foreign born service members, which include naturalized citizens and non citizens have fought in every major conflict in American history. Hundreds of thousands of immigrants pledged to defend the United States with their lives in the Civil War, both world wars, the conflicts in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, just to name a few. Over the last century, military service has provided a pathway for American, to American citizenship for more than 760,000 foreign-born service members. This long-standing policy, allowing immigrants to earn US citizenship through military service, has enhanced military readiness and strengthened national security. In recent years, however, naturalizations of non-citizen service members have decreased significantly. Many non-citizen service members have reportedly encountered numerous obstacles to naturalizing while in the service, including prolonged eligibility for certification of military service 
and the closing of many international field offices that provide immigration assistance to service members abroad. Barriers to naturalization prevent service members and veterans who have honorably served and fought in combat overseas from accessing critical benefits and much needed public services. Adding insult to injury, non-citizen veterans can and have been deported by the same nation they took an oath to defend. We have an obligation to care for non-citizen service members and veterans who risk their lives defending this nation and who may continue to live with health conditions because of their time in service. The objective of, to the objective of today's hearing is to examine the issues affecting the continuing ability of immigrants to serve in the US Armed Forces of the United States. It is our duty as a city to help our service members and veterans where and when they need it, especially when they are disadvantaged because of unfair or discriminatory policies. It's my hope that today's hearing will do exactly that. Turn it back to Chair Menchaca. Uh, thank you, Chair Dinowitz. And I wanna hand it over to our committee counselor, Arbani Oja for uh, some procedural items as we move forward. Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Huja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. And I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then members of the public will testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after that panelist has completed their testimony. I will now call on members from the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Amari Espinal, Assistant Commissioner of Community Affairs at DBS. Additionally, the following representative will be available for answering questions. Tom Tortorici, Director of Legal Initiatives at Moya. Before we begin, I will be administering the oath. Assistant Commissioner Espinal, Director Tortorici, I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Assistant Commissioner Espinal. I do. Thank you. Director Tudorici? I do. Thank you. Um, Assistant Commissioner, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Dinowitz, committee members and advocates. My name is Amari Espinal, and I'm proud to serve as the Assistant Commissioner of Community Affairs for the New York City Department of Veteran Services. I am joined today by Tom Tortorici, Director of Legal Initiatives from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I welcome this opportunity to testify about city services for foreign-born veteran families. Immigrants have long enlisted in all branches of the U.S. military, beginning with the Revolutionary War. The foreign-born represented half of all military recruits by the 1840s and 20% of the 1.5 million service members in the Union Army during the Civil War. Today, the number of veterans who were born outside the United States stands at approximately 530,000, representing 3% of all 18.6 million veterans nationwide. During times of peace, non-citizen members of the armed forces may obtain citizenship after one year of military service. Section 329 of the Immigration and Nationality Act authorizes the president to issue executive orders specifying periods of conflict during which foreign-born members of the US military are immediately eligible for US citizenship. Many non-citizens have used the military as an avenue to obtain expedited citizenship, encouraging non-citizens to enter the military by offering them expedited citizenship gives the military access to a broader pool of talented service members. With the cost of becoming a US citizen rising as fees increased by 83% in 2020, 
Naturalization via military service provides an alternate path to citizenship for non-citizens, while the military benefits from the range of skills that non-citizens bring. Under the Trump administration, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense implemented a series of new policies that have created barriers for non-citizens to gain citizenship via military service. In 2017, these new policies required the DOD to add more background checks for non-citizens and implemented mandatory wait times before the DOD could issue honorable service paperwork that non-citizens must have in order to apply for citizenship. These regulations led to the number of citizenship applications to drop to 1,069 for the first quarter of 2018, down from 3,132 in the last quarter of 2017. Although this policy was ultimately ruled illegal in 2020, it still had tremendous effects on the service members and families who had hopes of accessing the wide array of benefits a U.S. citizenship offers. As a result of the Trump administration policy, non-citizen service members have been denied the rights and privileges that accompany citizenship, including the right to vote, the right to sponsor non-citizen family members, and the right to travel with a passport. They also face heightened risks overseas due to, for instance, lack of access to consular services and protection typically available to citizen counterparts. For these reasons, foreign-born veterans across the country face challenges, including but not limited to employment difficulty, housing insecurity, low educational attainment, and cultural isolation. Throughout the city, there is a wide range of services to the foreign-born veteran community and an even more significant number open to all foreign-born New Yorkers. Although a veteran's citizenship status can affect their opportunities when attempting to connect with resources, DBS will still engage with and inform any veteran, regardless of their citizenship status, of benefits they may qualify for. For example, if a veteran discloses to DBS that they are a legal permanent resident seeking employment, assistance, and housing placement, DBS will engage with the veteran and inform them of their eligibility for employment opportunities with veteran preference, regardless of citizenship status. While employment is one such example, DBS stands ready to provide all foreign-born veterans with information about a variety of benefits and services they are entitled to, and will support a veteran in obtaining the legal services necessary to securing naturalization if requested. My colleagues at Moya also play a role in connecting immigrant veterans to the services they need. Through their Ask Moya hotline, Moya serves as a referral point for all immigrant New Yorkers, including immigrant veterans, in connecting with the services and help that they need. This includes immigration help. The city has invested tens of millions of dollars in immigration legal services, and the providers that Moya contracts with through its Action NYC program are capable of serving a, a wide range of clients including immigrant veterans and their families. We thank you for the opportunity to testify in this matter and look forward to any questions you or other committee members may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to questions from Chairman Chaka, followed by Chair Dinowitz. Panelists, if you could stay unmuted for um, this question and answer period, if possible, that would be appreciated. Um, thank you, and I'll turn it over to Chairman Chaka. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Arbani. And I, I want to start off with some questions that I, I don't know if Moya will have these. And in your testimony, you speak to this larger um, population of immigrant veterans. Uh, do we know how many of them are residing in the city of New York? Like as New Yorkers that, that fall under the category of immigrant veterans? Uh, so currently, uh, we do have uh, some data on that, uh, Chair Machaka, and about 5,400 uh, non-citizens in New York City, uh, or either active duty now, uh, in the past, or in the Reserves and National Guard. Okay, and d very curious about your data collection and uh, specifically about immigration status of veterans? Is that some, something that that is actively sought for in intake forms in any way or demographics that are provided on or um, are part of surveys when you do intake? Is that something that you collect? Uh, so 
through our Vet Connect platform, uh, we do ask the question of uh, uh, immigration status. Uh, so specifically with lawful permanent resident status, um, it is asked, although we don't um, have a high volume uh, of veterans that do report uh, being on that status. Can you repeat that last part? So although we do, we do ask the question of lawful permanent resident status, uh, it, it's a low volume that, that we receive for uh, assistance requests for, for that need. Okay, I wanna come back to that in, in my second round uh, in, sure. in just kind of intaking and really just tr trying to get a sense of the population itself and how we're engaging. Um, how are we coordinating an interagency um, effort to improve, improve on data, data collection about needs of these service members uh, these service members are probably engaging in other agencies as well. And so how are we really pulling all that data together to understand a, the better snapshot of need? So I uh, appreciate that question again, uh, Chair. With the uh, Executive Order 65, uh, which has uh, sister city agencies collecting uh, information on the veteran indicator question, um, we are making strides in, in collecting uh, data from all of our agencies um, to reflect their specific services tied in with that veteran status of, of, the, of the veteran themselves or their family members. Um, and we're happy to say that we have made uh, some strides with that and we're looking forward to, to having everyone, um, you know, complete their, their operational uh, changes to, to make that come to a full fruition. Can you give me an example of one of those strides that you're talking about? Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, basically with, with having the question of uh, have you or anyone in your household ever served in, in the military, including the National Guard or Reserve, uh, we can better refer uh, that individual or family uh, to appropriate services. Um, there are special services that exist um, for those who have served in the military as, as, as well uh, as their family members. So it would, it would better streamline uh, that individual, that family being connected to the appropriate referrals. Okay, um, and one service in particular that's really important, especially to this city council that has put so much money in something like CUNY Citizenship Now, uh, we have really doubled down our efforts in ensuring that if anyone needs a lawyer, veterans or non-veterans, needs a lawyer to help them through the process, getting a green card and becoming a, a citizen, um, how are you connecting anyone who comes to you who presents as um, as a veteran or a family member of a veteran and connects them to, how are you connecting them to citizenship process services? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Councilman. So uh, through our Vet Connect NYC platform, uh, we have an intake uh, process that uh, we gather as much demographic information as we can from that individual. Um, and then we have a number of different legal service providers uh, within the platform that uh, specifically deal with immigration law. Um, they are experienced and have that cultural competency as well, um, in addition to providing services in, in a number of different languages. Um, so we, um, again, we try to make that, uh, that distinction as far as, uh, you know, what language or what that specific uh, need is for that client to make that, that best referral and ultimately with the outcome of attaining that uh, citizenship status. And how many have you walked through the process uh, of full citizenship? Are, is that is there a number that tells us the city has walked you know, X amount of service members and vets through a citizenship process? How many? So uh, the current breakdown for the year 2021 uh, shows that we had four assistance requests uh, for immigration law. Say, th say that again, how many? Four four requests from all of your engagement throughout your um, agency interactions. Is that right? Four? Uh, for the year of 2021, yes. 2021. Uh, yeah. Is there a sense of, of over time, uh, since you started collecting data, how many have gone through? So if we did a scrub uh, from 2017 uh, to present, and uh, the number was uh, under 10. Okay, uh, I'm going to come back to that again uh, later. And 
I'm curious about who you're referring them to. Uh, so it sounds like there's four and potentially under 10 since 2017, you said? 2017, yes. Yeah, who are you, who are you referring these uh, New Yorkers to? Uh, again, we have a, a number of different uh, providers within the platform. Uh, some of them include uh, Legal Services NYC, uh, New York Legal Assistance Group, uh, Urban Justice Center, uh, Sunnyside Community Services, and then uh, Center of the Integration and Advancement of, of New Americans, Inc. And of course, um, you know, we also, uh, you know, if, if we have something that a provider may not be able to, to handle, you know, we, we connect with Moya um, through their, uh, you know, Action NYC line, and then, you know, try to, again, you know, really narrow down the needs of that, of that client to get them the, uh, the best results possible. And um, I'm just trying to pull all these numbers together uh, in, in real time in, in my head. And I'm thinking, you said about over, there's over 5,000 uh, New Yorkers who have presented uh, to you as having some kind of immigrant experience and you are only clocking in under 10 in the last 2017. What does that say about, about the uh, relationship that the veterans department has and the city has with, with our veteran, especially those who are, have some kind of immigrant experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly from those numbers, Councilman, it seems that, um, you know, there may be, uh, you know, lack of awareness uh, of the services that, that are provided by DBS. So, um, you know, we've made an effort to, um, you know, conduct outreach uh, specifically uh, with the New York City uh, veteran and community a military and a veteran community survey, um, uh, which we uh, sent out this year. We're trying to better assess the needs of the community um, and really, uh, you know, hope to get uh, the, those trend analyses um, for us to, to better serve the community and, and really look at what the needs are. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask one last question. I'm going to hand it over to my co-chair uh, for questions, and I'll come back for some deeper dives. Uh, do we know, do you know, if veterans, immigrant veterans, are eligible for VA benefits so that they can receive them? Yes. Uh, so they are uh, eligible for VA benefits. In general, citizenship status does not affect that. Um, they are still uh, eligible, mostly based off their uh, discharge characterization. Um, so yes, to your answer, no, VA benefits uh, are not affected um, by citizenship status. Okay, so they are, they are eligible to receive yes. those benefits. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause here and hand it over to my co-chair, Dinowitz. Thank you. Thank you, co-chair. I, I wanna pick up on some of the, the, the items that um, Chairman Chaka spoke about, starting with the last one about VA benefits. Based off, it's based off of discharge characterization. So if you were discharged honorably, you're entitled to those benefits. Do you see in, in, in the information and data you have, do you see a discrepancy between citizen discharge status and non-citizen discharge status? Uh, excellent question, uh, Chair. It's uh, there's no discrepancy. Uh, the only, uh, I would say, one of the only drawbacks that uh, someone who it is who is a non-citizen would face would be potentially if they are um, outside of the continental United States, um, they may not have uh, VA services or VA facilities uh, nearby or readily available, uh, you know, to attain the services that that someone in the United States uh, would have available to them. Um, so in other words, you know, physical location may impact the delivery of services. Okay, but based on the information you have, you don't see um, someone's immigration status as impacting how they were discharged from the military. No, no, it, it, uh, it doesn't have any impact on that. Okay, um, well, that's good to hear. Um, I, I, I want to go back to, again, some of the things that Chairman Chaka touched on. Um, the, um, the legal services available, um, I just want to get a little clarity on this. You said these were available through Moya, but very often people dealing with issues involving, you know, veterans and the armed services may, may need a different uh, or specialized type of, of legal service. 
um because veterans issues are at times complicated so are there in the in the um legal services you mentioned are there lawyers that specialize in this type of um in this type of law in this type of service yes absolutely councilman and uh, i don't know if i apologize if i misspoke earlier but those uh those providers which i mentioned uh, are in our vet connect nyc platform uh which so they they are uh culturally competent when it comes to uh, immigration and citizenship law, as well as military uh, culture as well. Uh, so they, they do have that, that, that niche uh, understanding of those unique situations. Okay, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm going uh, backwards, I'm packing, I'm packing these things. Um, but I wanna talk a little more about Executive Order 65, which you mentioned. Um, sure. So, so can you give me an example if, if, if someone enters, I don't know, a senior center, there's an intake form if they're if they're a first time member of that senior center. Is that how it works? So basically, uh, the the veteran uh, indicator question allows other city agencies to ask that individual whether uh, they or anyone in their household has served in the military, um, including the National Guard and Reserve. So in that instance, um, if there is a service that can be um, provided based on let's say for a senior uh, veteran. Um, they may be entitled to certain uh, compensation or pension benefits through yeah. the U.S. Well, yeah. So what, what I'm asking is, is for you to paint me a, a picture. When does someone fill out this intake form? Anytime when they the, interact with a city agency? So it should be anytime that uh, they interact. Uh, when, a, when a member of the public comes in and fills out an, an intake form uh, coming to a city agency, yes. So if I'm an older adult, uh, my first time I'm going to Rain Senior Center that's in my district, I'd, I'd fill out an intake form, right? What if I'm already a member of that center, right? If the executive order um, only commenced in March of this year, um, if I'm already a member of that center, then I'm not filling out the form again, right? This isn't a yearly form. This is a one-time thing, correct? Um, I can't comment on how uh, the Department of Aging, you know, uh, it's, just, as an, just as an but, example, right. just as an example. Right. right. So uh, have you been able to, <clears throat> excuse me, have you been able to work with these agencies? Because this is an important question and kind of the question, um, you know, Chairman Chaka was talking about um, something, uh, you know, problem that DVS has had is identifying the veterans in the first place, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if um, any efforts have been made, if, if it's been thought about to reach out not only to people coming in the first time in this intake form, but for, for folks who've been involved with, again, just as an example, our older adult centers, has there been any discussion about that? Uh, there's, there's been some communication uh, through the EO65 uh, as far as uh, going back and looking at previous uh, clients who have come into the uh, their respective centers or their offices, um, and you know we're, we're always DBS is always trying to keep open relationships with our sister city agencies to, to see how we can uh, further assist them in, in in gathering that data. Um, I don't know if my if my colleague uh, Tom Tudorici would, would like to uh, add on to that. Sure. Um, for <clears throat> direct city services, we would assume that. Uh, any uh, person the agency interacts with, whether presently or in the past, you know, in, in the course of their work, uh, they would pose this question. Um, um, sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, um, so for city agencies uh, interacting with the public, providing direct services to the public, mm -hmm. they would pose this question of anyone they interact with going forward, uh, following the EO. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I would just encourage you because it's that that key phrase, right, going forward, and that's so important, but it's also important to, to look back because I think this executive order is an acknowledgement that we have not identified all of our veterans and veteran families. And so I would encourage uh, Imoya and DVS to work with the city agencies to, yes, continue to look forward, but also to look back at the, you know, at, at, at folks who are involved in one way or another with city agencies and city services, but have not been asked that question because identifying 
um, our veterans, I think is, it's almost step number one to, to, to you know, for, for them accessing uh, help. Um, so, but just to be clear on Executive Order 65, are, are all city agencies now on their intake forms asking that question? Or is that still sort of a, a work in progress? Uh, we are, DBS is, is actively working uh, with all the city agencies, um, although no, uh, not all city agencies have uh, completed uh, the EO, uh, we are actively working with them uh, to, to make that come to fruition. Okay, all right. And when you speak to a, I, mean, I think one of the complicating factors, I think, um, is that if it's, I guess, if it's through Vet Connect, you're asking their permanent, uh, you're asking their, um, I guess, their immigration status. Uh, uh, legal, I, permanent legal permanent status. status. I apologize. Um, I, I will, I will tell you that, um, particularly after the Trump administration, um, it's often been very hard for some of our immigrant neighbors to, to say that. A lot of them are very scared, honestly, to say that. And so are, is there any sort of personal outreach you're, you're, you're doing any kind of not assuming one way or the other, but when you interact um, with a veteran, just informing them of, of the benefits and rights that they have, regardless of how they self-identified? Is that, is that a practice that you're engaging in? Yeah, so excellent question again, Chair. Um, it, it's obviously, we understand that uh, it's difficult for, for anyone to divulge their uh, uh, citizenship status. And um, again, I'll, I'll go back to us uh, releasing that, that veteran and military community survey. Um, you know, we uh, made it very clear that their responses uh, would be anonymous and kept confidential. Um, and we're just really trying to, to dig in deep into the community to see what their needs are. Um, if, if someone uh, does a call or submit an assistance request online, uh, the same confidentiality is assured uh, through us as well as through our uh, legal providers um, who will assist them in the future. Okay, and it's, I know a lot of my questions are centered on this sort of communication and trust, um, but you know, it, it's um, you know, an incredible thing to, to serve your country, especially if you're foreign born, um, and that there are, I think said 5,400 citizens and uh, was it four or six this year? Uh, uh, it's four this year. Four this year have availed themselves of the service of, of the services, the robust services our city provides and in, um, in, in acquiring citizenship, um, I think speaks to the need of, of you know, continuing to build that trust and build that communication um, of, of what DVS provides. Um, I want to acknowledge the presence of council member Eugene. Council member Eugene has joined us. Um, I'll, re I'll, 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 I'll give it back to Chairman Chaka for now to, for some follow-up. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and before I do some follow-up, are there any members, and I'll hand it over to Harbani to see if there are any other members uh, who have questions from the committee. Thank you, Chair. I see that Council Member Chin has her hand raised. Um, as a reminder, if there are any other Council Members that have questions, please use a Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. Um, I'll turn it to Council Member Chin for questions. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the co-chair um, for this hearing. Uh, Assistant Commissioner, you know, City Council, I mean, we pushed to set up um, the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, in New York City, because we see how important it is uh, to service our veterans, make sure they know what their rights are. So my question is that, you know, the number that you've you quoted for this year is only four. So relation, relating to outreach, like how are we letting uh, the veterans and especially the immigrant community know about services that are available to the people who have served this country? So. It comes back to question I raise constantly is that how are we utilizing local media, local organization, uh, ethnic media? I mean, those are the resources um, that is available to us and to let the larger community know that this is available and then they can inform their family members or their relative. So 
Is, uh, is your department utilizing that resource? I appreciate the question, uh, Council Chen. And uh, yes, so at DBS, uh, you know, obviously through the pandemic, we had to shift more to digital outreach, uh, but uh, we do uh, express our services during our Veterans Advisory Board meetings that happen on a quarterly basis. Um, you know, we do uh, have meetings with various community boards throughout the city. Uh, we do uh, communicate all of our services, including legal services throughout our weekly DBS newsletter. Um, we, we collaborate with CUNY, uh, veterans on campus um, and, and hold various meetings with them. And, and again, I'll go back to the community survey, which we're really trying to um, get that information directly from uh, our constituents and and uh, really trying to figure out what, what their needs are and, and if there exists a need uh, to, you know, to further expand our, our uh, legal uh, immigration services. So uh, we're, we're doing, uh, you know, outreach within various um, uh, tools. Uh, we're on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, um, you know- but are you, are you in, in, I, are you in? What's that noise? <laughs> okay. Are you, are you, what I'm also talking about is the local ethnic media. Like, do you publicize the veteran newsletter, your resources in those newspapers? Because a lot of the veterans who are immigrant, you know, their family member, they still rely on these local ethnic newspapers and, and radio station. You know, do you get yourself invited to some of the, you know, their TV station to really talk about uh, services that are available to our veterans. That's what I'm saying. Like these resources sure. are available and we need to utilize that. And I know that the mayor had an executive order asking every city agency to put a certain amount of budget um, to advertise in ethnic local media. So are you also doing that? Because that is such a great resource to at least get the information out to the, the larger immigrant community. Yeah, and that's an excellent question again. Uh, so we we are uh, again, council uh, woman. We're 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 in the local communities. Um, you know, we'd be willing to uh, uh, get support from the council on on these uh, ethnic um, media sources. Um, as always, we're trying to improve our, our reach throughout the community, and, and more than willing to um, you know receive any support from the council on on uh, on being connected to those. Um, that's what Moya uh, is. Just, <laughs> thank you. That's yeah. what the mayor's office, Moya, right? That's yes. what I'm saying, like interagency working together and they have the resources, right? So Absolutely. like, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. So just uh, to, yeah. just to respond a bit um, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so Moya conducts uh, outreach to immigrant New Yorkers broadly. Um, the hundreds of thousands of immigrant New Yorkers who uh, uh, seek services uh, that the city provides. And um, immigrant veterans are among that number, a small subset. The 5,400 uh, non-citizen um, uh, military uh, personnel in New York City, that number comes from the ACS 2019 data and includes active duty and veterans. So it's likely that the number of immigrant veterans is smaller than that number. Um, so through Maybe various, oh, uh, finish your answer. Please, yes, yeah. please continue. Sure. Yes. So our outreach efforts are broad. However, there are things that we can do to support DVS in their effort to direct conduct direct outreach to veterans. For example, USAIS lists in country order uh, the countries from which uh, veterans naturalize and come, and so we could assist them crafting targeted outreach. Um, but the uh, naturalization and immigration legal services uh, invested in by the city and at the tune of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars over the course of the past years um, are available to all immigrant New Yorkers, among them veterans. And we do believe that veterans deserve uh, direct outreach as well as uh, special services and are here to support that effort however possible. Yeah, I mean, that's why, boy, you have all the media contact, that you know the country, that you know which community media ethnic media you could reach out to. I, I, I just wanna see like lists of you know, 
radio program that you're on and, and network, you know, the cable TV, the, the newspaper that, that you put stories in, you know, even just stories about how uh, immigrant veterans um, got service. And, and this is how the community knows about it, then they can do the referral to their family members and friends. That, that's what I'm asking for, you know? So I hope that we can, you know, really get that out there so that more people will know about what's available to help them. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, co-chair. Thank you, council member uh, Chen. And you, I, I just wanna say thank you to uh, council member and chair of the aging committee. I'm reminded of the uh, hearing that you held uh, focused on immigrant, uh, sorry, on senior veterans. And I feel like it's the same conversation we keep having over and over and over and over again with the city agencies and especially thinking about now Moya and what they're not doing to really ensure that all these specific populations that we have relationships to like veterans through a veterans uh, department that Yao the council created because we know that that kind of engagement is necessary and and important that 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 this is not happening that you're getting you're getting recommendations from council members about how to do this and this is just this is co consistent and it is a small population but but the, it's a it, i believe and i think this is what we're, we're trying to get to the bottom of whether the the, the current knowable population is truly the total population and and the onus is being placed on the community to connect to city and this is time and time again every agency that we keep having conversations around we it's like we're waiting for for community members to to join us uh when it should be the other way around and so council member chin's comments and recommendations are good but they're they come all the time and this is how we we direct you and so um, I'm just frustrated right now, just listening to this back and forth uh, in a big way. And so maybe what I can do is ask Moya, um, how, how, what, the, what, how are you creating the strategies that are built out of outcomes with the Department of Veteran Services? And, and do you have, does that exist right now? Are you, are you really looking at numbers about, about who, who's out there and how you're moving them through a, a legal process? for a uh, green card and ultimate citizenship. Does that exist? And maybe this is to Tom or anybody else at Moya who's on the call. Sure, we believe very strongly uh, in providing veterans with the services they need, including naturalization services. Um, and we'll continue to work with DVS in order to ensure that uh, they do receive them um, and, and that they know about them. Um, Okay, so that, that's not what I'm at. I'm not asking about belief uh, because you, you could believe it or not. I, I'm not interested in your belief. I'm interested in the outcomes and the strategies that you have, you're building in and that you're holding yourself accountable to. Does that exist? No, we currently do not ask uh, our contracted immigration legal service partners uh, to report veterans data to us at Moya. Um, it has not historically been amongst the data that is reported. Um, however, as part of a, a comprehensive immigration legal consult, uh, our provider will collect that information in order to make an uh, assessment and evaluation of the eligibility status of the individual to naturalize or, or avail themselves of some other benefit. Um, so we have not historically capture that data, therefore can't speak to outcomes. However, I have had a number of conversations uh, anecdotally with partners with respect to the numbers they see. And it's similar to what my colleague at DVS has explained. Um, CUNY Citizenship Now uh, indicated that over the past 20 years, only a small handful, less than 10 uh, veterans have sought naturalization uh, through their service. They indicated that most uh, military personnel seek naturalization, non-citizen military through while they are serving. Um, and right. so, right. yeah, so, so we will continue to work with DBS um, and our partners in order to ensure that veterans specifically uh, receive outreach and are aware of services. So, okay, I'm gonna pull pieces of that. And I just wanna pause really quick. Are there any other members that have questions before I keep going? Um, 
At this time, we're not seeing any hands. Um, okay. I will just remind again, council members, if anyone has questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, for now, I'll turn it back to you, Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Harbani. And okay, so let's 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 take the the data collection. Um, so you're not collecting data, so we don't even know how 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 we're doing at this point when we're taking veterans into consideration. I understand that there's a larger push for legal services across. So I get I get I get the catch all that that's not working clearly. Um, so does Moya have any data through Action NYC, as was mentioned earlier by the assistant commissioner on how many vets and military members have been served through Action NYC? Um, now, that that's a very specific action NYC. There are a lot of other tentacles of legal services, but I'm just trying to focus on action NYC. Uh, no, Chairman Chaka, we have not gathered yeah. that information. Got it. So it, it's really nowhere across across the. Um, now, the I, I think the other question really is kind of thinking through what would happen um, if someone made contact as a veteran, and then now I'm kind of shifting over to DBS and presented as a, um, an LPR, uh, uh, a legal permanent resident, and whether or not that automatically connects them to legal services so that they can move through uh, the process. Is that something that's automatic? Just wanna get a sense about your relationship. As, as, as I'm understanding is it, we have to wait for them to present themselves and, and identify themselves as, is there an automatic connection to legal services for citizenship. So so should we uh, communicate with any veteran who does uh, present with that need, uh, Councilman? We would, uh, again, uh, perform an assessment and refer them to uh, any one of the providers within the platform, as well as uh, giving them the, the toll-free number uh, for CIS, um, you know, for, for military um, service members, uh, you know, to uh, get expedited, um, uh citizenship process you know with the, some of the benefits of uh res shorter resident re residency requirements um no state of residence and and then the uh the waived application fees as well so they would have the option to either uh be referred to the uh, service providers uh, or uh, directly call cis and, and um you know uh, get the information themselves and be helped through uh through that platform okay so i, I guess i get the process the, the i guess the the question i because I think what I'm hearing you say is that if they present with the need, so not only do they have to say, hey, I'm a legal permanent resident, I'm an LPR, I'm a veteran, I'm an LPR, but they have to also say to you, I kind of, I need some legal services here. So can you help me walk through the process? And then you do an assessment. Is that, is that how it works? They have to present the need? I, or, yes, Councilman. Or, there, there is a, um, yeah, yes, we have to get a general sense of uh, what that uh, whether the individual is is seeking help with, whether it be legal services, employment, housing, et cetera. Uh, we do have to narrow that down to a, a specific category. Okay, and and I guess the the flag here is that someone it, it's 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 like all these barriers that we're trying to identify for you all and and expose so that we can solve the issue. We want to do that with you. Um, there's just a lot of passion behind these. So thank you for bearing with us here. Um, but sometimes New Yorkers might not even know that they are eligible. There's some issues with knowledge. Maybe it's a family member. The 5,000 veterans have family members that are eligible. So this number explodes and there might be a need for, uh, for this that might not even be fully known. And so there's so much onus on, on the New Yorker and, and I think that's what we're trying to, to expose here. Is that understood? Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll, you know, say councilman that that, that is a, um, a challenge uh, for veterans with uh, respect to all, uh, all benefits, um, as far as them not knowing that they may qualify. Uh, some service members aren't even aware that they qualify as being a veteran um, because either they, we're not in the combat zone or didn't serve during a certain era. So yeah, it's a challenge that DBS uh, faces on a daily basis. And, um, you know, we're always striving to, to hit each of those 
uh, touch points, you know, and, and really educate and inform our, 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 our constituency to, you know, be informed and, and apply to those benefits, even if they may not be eligible for them to apply and see what happens. Uh, but especially with regard to citizenship status, um, yeah, we definitely um, make every effort, uh, again, to to not only point them in the right direction, but but inform them that, that hey, these services do exist and we're here to, um, you know, to help you with that process. And I think just a uh, larger uh, point is that we're not even doing that in ethnic media sometimes. And there, there are a lot of gaps to that outreach and that, that your original strategies is, is, is potentially uh, not enough. It's not adequate. And, and so let's move over to the data collection, because I think this is something that the committee, our, our committee on immigration has been thinking a lot about. And we have passed some bills in the last eight years protecting data collection. And so, um, especially when looking at status, immigration status, can you clarify, and this is maybe for Moya or for DVS and DVS, um, can you clarify how this practice of collecting data interacts with local law 247 of 2017, which regulates the collection, the retention, and the disclosure of personal identifying information, including immigration status? So I, I, I guess I'll begin and, and then turn it over to Tom. But uh, Councilman, again, we, we have a, a certain uh, number of questions that we ask, um, and then other questions may be asked based off that algorithm. Um, but again, we, we uh, guarantee confidentiality with anything that's uh, disclosed um, during a conversation with uh, our staff, as well as any of the uh, providers which you may make referrals to. Um, and Tom, I don't know if you want to uh, expand on, on what Moya uh, practices. Sure. Um, all personally identifying information collected by our immigration legal service contracted partners uh, is protected and confidential, and Moya does not have access to that individual data. Uh, the reporting to us comes in aggregate, uh, as mandated by uh, the various laws controlling privacy, um, and we 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 don't uh, see it or we can't access it even if we wanted to. Um, on top of that, it's protected by. Uh, attorney client you know confidentiality and all the various privileges and so that information is well protected and that's just through your contracts so that's legal legal services contracts uh through this vet connect and i just got online and i looked at the vet connect uh, portal is that something that falls under the local law Yes, Councilman. So uh, VetConnect is a platform that is contracted out uh, by DBS, and so they um, they offer you know uh, all those uh, uh, confidentiality um, uh, that comes along with with case management, referrals, um, et cetera. So yes, they they are contracted by us and fall under those same um, regulations. Okay, um, I I think there's a dis some discrepancy then. I if, if 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 local law 247 dictates the the collection of data i think there might be some issues there and i don't know if moya is picking that up right now in terms of how how we're asking veterans for legal status and at what point that happens and gets collected and and then something happens on the legal services side so i just want to flag that as as something that's real uh, especially since there are many mixed status families that have a potential LPR and then a um, and uh, undocumented family members. And so these are all part of uh, the local law. What we're trying to do is protect, which makes it difficult, right? So if we can't ask people their immigration status, how do we, how do we know how to engage? And, and what does that engagement look like? And I think, I think this is all about, and this is something that Chair Dinowitz mentioned many times about trust and relationship. How, what is our relationship to our veterans in our city? And I think we're, we're trying to expose um, these weak components of our current strategy and outcomes. Um, to, uh, Tom, did you have a, a point or question? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I want to come back <laughs> to to that after after the hearing, 
I want to pause here really quick before I keep going on questions. And uh, Chair Dinowitz, I don't know if you had have any follow ups. Yeah, just just a few follow ups. I mean, I, I think the way Chairman Chuck that you articulated it was was I think very appropriate. Trying to break down uh, the barriers, um, it, and and I think uh, Councilmember Chin gave one great example of um, ethnic media. Uh, I don't know about anyone here, but I've seen lots of advertisements on TV, on Hulu, uh, regarding vaccinations. I mean, the city does this. The city does advertisement on TV for, for vaccination, for information about schools. So this is something that the city has experience with. Um, I, 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 I guess the question, have you considered taking out advertisements on Hulu, on YouTube, on Facebook to inform the public of these services, of the, of the great services that you uh, clearly provide and to help break down those barriers. Sure, that's an excellent point, uh, Chair. And, uh, you know, we, we can certainly discuss that uh, internally and with our communications team here to you know, further expand our outreach and really, you know, pinpoint um, th those uh, niche communities. Um, so always willing to 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 expand our reach. Um, Tom, I don't know if you'd like to answer that as well. Uh, only that we look forward to supporting you uh, and providing not only guidance and information, uh, but relationships and um, uh, various other you know supports to make sure that that happens. We believe strongly in that effort. Okay, so I mean it's. Um... All right, it's not ha happening. Um, you know, we have, and 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 again, just as I, <clears throat> I feel as though I'm kind of copying Chairman Chaka, which is which is okay, smart guy. Um, it's it's a little, you know, we're here to help, we're here to work together, but it's also a little weird that kind of we're the ones um, providing, you know, this this information. You know, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of New Yorkers are getting vaccinated. Um, and there's questions that the New York City form asks. Is veteran status one of those questions? I'm sorry, Councilman, uh, you saying on, on any particular form, if that's a question that's asked? Well, New York City has a, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but New York City has a form that's filled out. It asks you things like your name, date of birth, you know, have you had X, Y, Z? How do you, do you identify as Hispanic, Latino, or Latina? What sex were you assigned to birth? How do you identify your gender? Asks about disabilities. Have you worked with um, with the, the health department, I guess, to add that 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 veteran question? It's a lot of people getting vaccinated. It would be a great. It would have been, I guess, a great opportunity um, to get that information that you so desperately need. Sure. Uh, excellent question, Chair. So we uh, we have partnered uh, with PEU uh, to uh, ask that question. Uh, again, have you or anyone in your household ever served in the, in the military, including the National Guard Reserve? I'm sorry, you and, partnered? Uh, I just missed you partnered with who? With PEU, uh, Public Engagement Unit uh, from the Mayor's Office. So uh, we uh, coordinated with them to um, add that question uh, for uh, individuals who are seeking uh, uh, health insurance coverage, and so we're we're getting information from uh, from the public engagement unit, um, and then referring them uh, if they do qualify and, and are willing to receive uh, health coverage at the VA, um, connect them there, uh, and if they're otherwise not eligible for uh, VA services, to connect them uh, otherwise to other um, healthcare coverage services. I'll get back to the VA, but I, I'm asking, you know, about the, the vaccination form itself. There are questions sure. that are asked, right? I, I am not someone, I, you know, I, I have health insurance through my job, but I, you know, got a New York City vaccine. So I'm one of those people who, I'm not a veteran, but I, as someone like me who may be a veteran is someone who would, in, in, you know, interact with a city agency in, in one way, but not another. And I think the point is, um, I, I guess I guess the vaccination form is not under Executive Order 65. Um, but 
I guess what I'm asking is, can it be as more and more people are getting vaccinated, especially now as the mandates are being implemented and as people are getting booster shots? I think this is an incredible opportunity to get that information um, that is so desperately needed. Who is a veteran? That's an excellent point, Councilman. It's something that uh, we're definitely, you know, uh, going to explore and see if, you know, we can make that uh, a reality. Okay, and I would highly recommend, <laughs> highly recommend um, making it a priority because people are, you know, the, the mandate for city workers has just begun. Um, at some point, we may have a mandate for students whose families may have served in the military. And I think <clears throat> as people, by the way, everyone should get vaccinated um, to do it. But as we are, as New York City is taking in more of this information, this is an incredible opportunity to do exactly what I think D uh, DVS wants. Um, the purpose of executive order 65 is, this is an incredible opportunity. It's, it's, it's a form that people are filling out and to just ask that one question would give us a lot of information and then allow us in your conversations to ask about, you know, if you need help with immigration um, services. Um, my, my other question is sort of your, I mean, this, this comes up all the time, but your relationship with the federal government and the federal veterans affairs, what coordination is there um, specifically as these I guess these, um, these centers are closing to help immigrant veterans. What interactions do you have with the federal government? Um, you know, among other things, besides identifying the veterans, to let them know that DVS, New York City, is a safe place and a home for our foreign born veterans and, and that we can help them. We can help them um, navigate this, the, the complex system. Sure. Uh, so uh, I know that that we've had uh, DVS has had a couple of conversations uh, with CIS um, to let them know that you know we're, we're as a municipal uh, agency that that we are serving the veterans of the city, um, and and you know to let them know that, that we're always uh, willing to um, make make referrals their way as well as as um, having them keep us updated on any uh, updated laws or policies. Um, that may impact um, those individuals uh, getting their their citizenship status. Um, you know, uh, as well as as working with Moya, uh, you know, as the as the main city agency, you know, who deals with immigration. Um, we hope to get um, you know a stronger a stronger base. And as as Councilman uh, Menchaca mentioned, we don't know what we don't know. So we're we're always trying to get that information and building those relationships. And and it, and it takes time, but um, we feel that we're 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 trying to make um, strides in, in getting to a place where the, the veteran community would have that trust um, to divulge uh, their citizenship status and, and um, you know, want, uh, want, that, uh, want to begin that path uh, towards that goal. Um, my, I guess my next question is, is for Moya. Um, a few months ago, and I think any of the other council members can help me out on the details, but we passed uh, a charter revision to establish an office of ethnic media where the city agencies would spend, I think half of their uh, outreach efforts on um, outreach funds on you know, specific targeted groups, ethnic groups, specific geographic locations. Um, is that established under Moya? Is it another agency uh, uh, in, in city government? Has there been any talk among your agencies about this uh, this bill that was enacted, I, I think it was May, but uh, has there any discussion about that? Um, not uh, involving me uh, so far. Um, however, I will get get back with my colleagues and uh, and return to the conversation. Okay. I'll follow up after the hearing. Thank you, thank you, and Mr. Espinal, you hadn't heard anything about this. I, I have not, Councilman. Um, I, I can um, certainly, uh, you know, again, uh, do some research, get with my colleagues, and, and we'll have a response for you at a later time. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Turn it back thank to Chairman Chaka. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Dinowitz. And and I think what what I I'd like to do. I think we we've, we've kind of uncovered a lot of um, weak links between 
the not just Moya as the, the kind of driving force of immigrants across every city agencies, but even how we're connecting to immigrants uh, in the veterans world. And so we have a great panel. Uh, and I, I, I want to ask that we keep Moya and DVS on. Uh, and is that something that you can do? Um, I know that your commissioners are not here and we haven't mentioned that, but um, it's always a disappointment when the commissioners who are at the helm of these agencies are not here to listen to public and to members of the council that clearly have great ideas about how you can do things better. Uh, and, and so that's always a disappointment, but it's really great that you're here engaging with us. Can you stay and listen to the panels that we've constructed throughout the rest of the time? Is that, is that absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, confirmation? Absolutely, I can do that. Beautiful. Um, we're going to hear from some really great folks that I think can offer not only their own ideas and te through testimony, but uh, potentially some new strategies that we can employ together. Um, and especially if you need more resources to get these things done, then that's where the council comes. We have the power of the budget, and that's why it's important to, for you all to engage with us. Um, so let's let's do that. Let's get our next panel up and going. I know we are joined by Assembly Member Catalina Cruz, uh, who's no stranger to the City Council, uh, was the backbone of so much of what we did here at the City Council and Immigration Committee and supporting the speaker. So we're just really happy to have her um, and others join us. So uh, I'll hand it over to and back to Committee Council. And then throughout periodically throughout the hearing, I'll, I'll, I will ensure that uh, we recognize uh, DBS uh, Assistant Commissioner Espinal uh, and Tom over at Moya. Thank you for keeping your cameras on and being engaged. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. At this time, we've concluded administration testimony. I'd like to thank um, this panel for their testimony. And we will be now moving on to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify, and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist uh, should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I would like to now welcome our first panel to testify. In order, I will be calling on retired Lieutenant Colonel Margaret Stock, followed by Assembly Member Catalina Cruz, followed by Yesenia Mata, followed by Coco Colhane, followed by Cesar Vargas. Um, Margaret Stock, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Um, I'm in an airport, so I apologize for the mask wearing, but I'm complying with the federal mandate and trying to stay healthy. Clicker. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so anyway, I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel Margaret Stock. I'm a military police officer in the Army Reserve. And I was fortunate enough in 2009 to spearhead an immigrant recruiting program centered in New York City. It was called the Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest Program. And the Army chose New York City to start this recruiting program because New York City has an incredibly diverse population with highly educated immigrants who were very eager to join the United States Army. In fact, they were so eager that they were often camping out at Fort Hamilton, uh, quite anxious to earn their citizenship through military service. Unfortunately, that great success story became a negative story approximately four or five years ago when the Trump administration decided that it no longer wanted to recruit immigrants for the military, and it no longer viewed them as an asset, but rather as some kind of national security threat, and also decided to obstruct their pathways to citizenship. And so today, we're still dealing with the fallout from that change in policy. And today, it's actually very, very difficult for many immigrants joining the military to get their citizenship. And they're leaving service now, often without their citizenship. I heard a little bit earlier that you're having a hard time counting these folks. Um, I will tell you there's a lot of them in the New York area because they're my clients. And I have at least more than 10 clients who are immigrant veterans right now who are not able to get their citizenship and are fighting with the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense in order to try to get their citizenship. 
And it's very important for many of them to get their citizenship because they also have family members in the New York area who are undocumented. I recently, I was able to get a young man in New York City, his citizenship, and he turned around and promptly filed petitions for his mother and his father. His mother's case was quickly granted. His father we're still waiting on, but um, it's not just one person that's affected when an immigrant leaves the military. It's the whole family that's potentially affected. And there are military benefits programs that uh, impact the families, but in order to access many of them, the military member or veteran has to get citizenship first. And that process now is not as easy as it used to be. It used to be sort of a success story under the um, Bush and Obama administrations. And then under the Trump administration, it turned into a, a destruction situation where people were no longer being allowed to apply for citizenship and their pathways were just barred and they were viewed as a big security threat. So I know I have a limited amount of time to discuss this. I'm happy to take your questions, but I do think um, if you're interested in trying to get a count on the number of immigrants, the best source would probably be to poll immigration lawyers and immigration service providers in the New York City area and get them to give you a, a, a head count because I don't think you're gonna, you're not gonna get it from Department of Homeland Security. They don't track people. Uh -huh. um, so you're just not gonna get that data from them. It's not gonna be accurate data. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Assembly Member Catalina Cruz to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Committee Council. And, and I can't uh, uh, miss please. my opportunity to say hello work. to Sergeant Perez. We worked together for many, many years. Uh, and the support team is, you always got to give them props. I am Assembly Member Catalina Cruz. I represent Jackson Heights, Corona, and Elmhurst. And like Caesar, who will testify a little while later, I am also a former dreamer. I grew up undocumented, and the issues of our immigrant community um, are at the core of everything I do each and every day. You know, I heard a little bit of the testimony from earlier and, and thank you um, to, I, I missed her title, so I don't wanna not give it to her, but Margaret, thank you for what you said. You know, I think the fact that our government is sitting here and saying we can't count folks is a problem. Um, I, I ran into the same issue when I was trying to figure out statewide in order to testify here today, how many immigrant veterans we have. And I think it's not just about immigrant veterans because we are forgetting about the families, the families of the folks who have given their life, their sacrifice, their heart, their soul, their everything for this country. We got to make sure that we're counting them as well. Um, I have a bill at the state legislature that looks to deal with exactly what uh, Assistant Commissioner Espinal is saying it's an issue, which is um, the outreach, the ability to actually get this information to folks. Because if we have programs at the, at the state level, at the city level, and at the federal level that could in fact benefit the folks who have given everything for all of us to be here today, then we gotta do better by them. We are failing our immigrant communities, we are failing our veteran communities, and we can do better. The Sergeant Jimenez um, Act is named after a uh, son of Corona Queens who passed away um, after he was captured in the Iraq war. He was missing for two years, and during those two years, his wife was actually fighting against her deportation. If it wasn't for um, um, for a parole in place that had been put um, um, into the books around that time with the federal government, she would have been deported to the Dominican Republic or she would have been sent to the Dominican Republic to await her fate. And there are many, many benefits that are available to our immigrant veterans. But the fact that they don't know it exists that failure is on us. That failure is on the fact that we don't have a commissioner today. And I got to tell you, uh, Chairman Menchaca, that failure is also on our own colleagues who are not here today. I only see two council members joining. I, I heard there was one earlier, but the fact that there aren't more, that tells us a lot about the respect that our immigrant veterans and their families are getting from folks. I expect better from our city colleagues. I expect better from my state colleagues. And I hope that uh, we actually pass this bill unanimously with both bipartisan support in the state assembly. And I hope that we get to pass it uh, unanimously in 
the Senate next year. And what it will do is create a division within the uh, Office of Veteran Affairs that'll co be completely dedicated to doing outreach to immigrant communities, the veteran immigrant communities, to let them know about the resources, everything from how to apply for citizenship, because as we heard from Margaret, it has become extremely difficult to how to help their own families if they're going through an immigration issue, um, how to get a lawyer to defend a deportation, all of those things that if they're hard enough for an, uh, an immigrant, can you imagine for a veteran who's spending half their life in another place fighting for our country to make sure that we have the rights that we get to have today and we can't even do that for them? We got to do better. And so my call is for our city council to do the same. Perhaps we should be creating the kind of same program, a program or, or at least dedicate a staffer or two to do the outreach to immigrant veterans. We gotta do better by them. You know, Cesar, who will testify later, and, and I don't wanna steal this piece of it, but he and I have had co numerous conversations about how difficult it was for him to become a citizen. Like if you wanna give your life, your time, your dedication to this country, why are we not repaying that sacrifice, not only of the veteran, but of their family with that same respect and that same level of commitment. And so we gotta do better. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Assistant Commissioner, but the fact that we can show up here with no data, the fact that we can show up here, no offense to you because I've been a staffer too, without the actual commissioners here today, tells us a lot about the place in the food line, if you will, or in the pyramid of power that our immigrant veterans have, and we have to do better by them. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to working with all of you to do better by our veteran immigrants. We can't on the one hand tell them to do more for our country and when they actually do, this is what we do to them. Thank you and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Yesenia Mata to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. Good morning, Chairs Menchalka and Dinowitz. My name is Isenia Mata. I am the exec Executive Director of La Colmena, an immigrant rights organization that supports day laborers and domestic workers. I am also a military police specialist in the United States Army Reserve. Thank you, Chairs Menchalka and Dinowitz, for holding this critical hearing on this issue that often is forgotten in the broader conversation of military service. I would like to focus my testimony on immigrant military families. When a service member is on duty for their country, it is the entire family that bears the weight of military service. Deployments are often felt by the entire family, mothers, spouses, children. When a soldier makes the ultimate sacrifice, the entire family feels a loss. And when somebody, someone is in a military family, either the soldier or sibling or spouse is an is an immigrant, the entire family goes through the insecurity or fear or possible deportation or lack of access due to their immigration status or lack thereof. Across the five boroughs and through my work, I have been working with military families, mostly immigrant parents who have children in the armed forces. They reach out because they say they don't know where they can turn to seek help for, for either legal or mental pressure within the military service. As some of my fellow, fellow panelists have said, there are legal channels to help undocu uh, undocumented, uh, undocumented military parents, and yet these parents don't know that and thus live in the shadows of deportation. There's mental services or financial assistance that military families can tap into, but they don't see the city as a partner that understands their military service. There's already a lack of mistrust in government amongst the immigrant community and even more in military families. I know we can do better and I look forward to working with you, council members, the Office of Immigrant Affairs and Veteran Services to ensure that our immigrant military service members can know they can turn to their city for support. And once again, thank you for holding this important hearing. And thank you to, to uh, as well to Catalina Cruz for ensuring that we can keep supporting immigrant families. And thank you, Margaret Scott Stock for continuing uh, being a leader in this movement and for ensuring that immigrant soldiers are represented. Thank, thank you. you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Coco Cohen to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. 
Hi, I'm Coco Colhane, the founder and executive director of the Veteran Advocacy Project, or VAP. We provide free legal services to low-income veterans and their families. I just wanted to talk today. I wasn't going to testify because we don't provide uh, immigration services, um, but I realized that we have so many clients over the last decade who have faced so many challenges. Um, so I wanted to just speak to their stories since they're not here to use their voices. Um, and just wanted to say that one of the problems that we've seen is that you know we would send someone who was a Vietnam veteran widow and she would go to a legal services provider and be told, well, we don't know military law. So I think that there is a challenge in terms of just you know basic understanding. And maybe she just got the wrong attorney that day, but we also have seen um, instances where I remember in the fall of 2018, we sent a veteran and he was told, well, this isn't a good time for veterans. I'm not sure why. I think there's some basic um, cultural competency maybe that does need to occur in, in um, working between maybe DVS and, and MOYA. And um, when it comes to, I always have to talk about this, uh, veterans with less than honorable discharges, um, they are being left behind. This is a huge factor. Um, you know, one story we've been working with a veteran whose dream was to serve in the U.S. military. And he came to the United States um, when he was a teenager. He overstayed his visa. He enrolled in school in the Bronx. And a recruiter came to him and said, don't worry about it. I can get you in. And a few years into his service as, you know, impeccable service as a Marine, he discovered those papers were fake and that this recruiter was um, being prosecuted because he had done this with over a dozen individuals and his enlistment was fraudulent. This was announced in front of his entire unit. He was then hazed for two years. He began drinking. They offered him a deal, testify you'll get um, a general discharge. He could have stayed in the United States. He could have you know, kept on uh, living out his American dream at least, even though he was losing the dream of being a US Marine. Um, after two years of being kept mostly on restriction, which meant he had to muster once every hour, he lost it um, and he shoved a non-commissioned officer. He faced court martial and uh, was given a bad conduct discharge and put eventually into removal proceedings. So someone who basically was you know, abused by this recruiter um, is now for the last 10 years has been trapped in limbo. Um, we went to pro bono counsel to try to help him. We stayed in his proceedings. He's, but it's looming over him. He can't get a job because of his discharge status. His bad conduct discharge status bars him from health care from the VA. He's really trapped. And there are so many of our clients that are actually in a very similar situation. So I would just hope that um, the state and the, and the city is doing incredible work to help these kinds of individuals. Time. But I would just hope that we don't lose sight of them at all government levels. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Cesar Vargas to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, chairs. Thank you so much for holding this such critical hearing. That's very important to me. My name is Cesar Vargas. I'm an immigration attorney and corporal in the United States Army Reserve, and also uh, have the honor to work at the city council under Council Member Chaka. Um, and for me, I think what Council Member Chaka and, and Council member Dinowitz really focused on is really on the story of our immigrant veterans and military families. And I think that is the point of what this hearing is about to really connect with the stories and provide those services. And like many uh, immigrant veterans, uh, I was born in Puebla, Mexico and brought to the US when I was just five years old after my father passed away. Now a widow with few savings and with little to no employment opportunities for her, my mom decided to say goodbye to my grandparents and our place of birth. Like millions of immigrants before us, she wanted to pursue the American dream any way she could, even if it was through a dangerous trek through the desert, but with the hopes that one day, maybe one of her sons could become an attorney. Thankfully, we made it across safely. America was not uh, my home. However, growing up without lawful immigration status closed many doors for me. Admission to top universities was out of reach because I didn't have a social security number. In fact, I was told by a high school, high school counselor that I couldn't go to college because I was quote unquote illegal. Amid the denial letters I received from college, colleges, the one from West Point hurt particularly badly because from very early on, I wanted to serve my country in uniform after learning of the contribution of immigrants during the civil war and their service 
their proactive service to join the Union Army because they wanted to also join in the fight to abolish slavery. That is, that is the commitment of, commitment of immigrants in a military, serving their country and serving for truly to benefit the equality and justice of our nation. But despite those hurdles, I was not giving up. I graduated from college and law school at the top of my class. It took a four year legal battle, but New York Supreme Court finally allowed me to practice law in 2015. We won, I, become new, I became New York's first undocumented attorney. And then long last in 2016, I, be, I obtained my green card and literally enlisted the same day, fulfilling my longstanding commitment to serve my country and to ensure that my mother no longer had to fear being deported because she would now have legal protection through my military service. It was in basic training, I saw firsthand the difficult three front war a soldier must fight just to become a citizen. On the one hand, a broken and complex immigration system on the civilian front, a rigid chain, internal chain of command on the military front, and the lack of institutional and government supports once we get out. Some forego becoming citizens as they juggle the military obligations and in the face of the government's own effort to make the legal process more difficult, as we saw under the Trump administration. Others only become citizens after death. Did you know that one of the first U.S. service members killed in the Iraq war was undocumented? That's the story of Marine Lance Corporal Jose Gutierrez, who was shot in the chest as his unit took heavy fire in the Iraqi port of Uncasar. He should have been a citizen the moment he wore his uniform. My mother taught me the value of service, not simply to a country, but to a commitment that we can create a better place, a better place in our little piece of the world here in New York City. Just this February, after years of delay and background checks, my long journey of 31 years to become a US citizen was finally completed. And I was able to accomplish this through the incredible support of incredible people, including Lieutenant Colonel Margaret Stock, who helped me along the process. We always need an advocate on our side. And Margaret was an advocate, along with Catalina Cruz, uh, uh, Council Member Menchaca, and our entire team. I have helped about 50 service members, including their loved ones, but I can't do this alone. Here in New York City, together with the City Council, to together with the Mayor's Office, with Moya and DBS, we can do our part to build coalition of services to ensure that non-citizen service members, as well as their families, can know that their city, that their state, that their country has their back. So I look forward to working with city agencies and with the city council and with our partners at every level of government to ensure that we honor their service. Because at the end of the day, this is, it's, it's, about, our, it's about veterans using their voice, not just, to, uh, not just to attack, but to use their training to defend those values that we all hold dearly. So thank you for giving me the opportunity and I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much for your testimony. Um, this concludes testimony for this panel. So I'm going to turn it to the council members for questions, starting with Chairman Chaka. Uh, thank you to this entire panel. Uh, it and 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 thank you to the active service members. Uh, both Caesar and Yesenia are serving. Uh, and if there was anybody else that was serving, I want to say thank you to you for your service uh, and your recommendations. Uh, I think so much came out of that work that I think you're seeing being in the middle of it and really bringing that to the city council so that we can inform our agencies. And thank you to the agencies for staying for, for this panel. Um, I think my, my first question, I want to go back to Margaret, who really laid the foundation, uh, I think, for, for me, and really understanding how we think about information and data. Uh, you have many cases, I think, that can, that can support a kind of larger vision. And one, the last thing that you said, and I want to see if there are any other recommendations that you can, we can all hear about together, uh, because we will be following up on how we, how we get better data and information and collect with the full understanding that we have to keep people safe. Uh, and so how, how, how has it worked? Have you seen it work in other cities where, where we, convene law, we can convene lawyers that are doing immigration work and seeing if we can get an anecdotal understanding of, of what, what, the, what the universe is? Uh, and any other ideas that you have, we're all ears. Well, just the most obvious example is with deported military veterans nationwide. The Department of Homeland Security admitted that it had no idea how many veterans it had deported because it wasn't tracking them. 
And so what the what happened was private individuals got together and started creating a database. And in particular, there's a veteran, Hector Barajas, who's kind of famous now nationally, who mm. started an Excel spreadsheet and just started collecting names. And then he started working with the ACLU. And the ACLU now has probably one of the more comprehensive lists of deported veterans of anybody. Um, in fact, it's Department of Homeland Security came to the ACLU and said, we can't figure out how many of these people there are. Can you help us? You know, because the government itself didn't know. Um, and the VA was going to the ACLU and saying, we don't know how many people there are. Can you help us? You know, so I think part of it is you got to partner with the private entities that are aware of the existence of veterans. Coco mentioned she knows about some people, you know, so reaching out to legal service providers and veteran service providers and asking them to start the tabulating. Course, the course. And of course, having somebody responsible for making the count who's reliable, I think is key. Yeah. And it could be a government entity, you know, Cesar, I know just got the David prize and I, I think he's really interested in the issue. So I'm hoping that perhaps he might be a person that might be willing to take the lead on forming some kind of coalition that can start getting an accurate count, because I know it's not seven to 10 people, you know, it's a lot more than that. Myself, I'm, I'm an attorney in Alaska, and I have more than 10 clients in New York City who are military vets, you know, seeking help on immigration issues. Um, and of course, they're family members as well. And a lot of them, as somebody mentioned earlier, don't know to access the government for you know benefits and things they just not they're not aware of that you'd be amazed at the ignorance out there about veterans benefits uh, yeah. and whether they're accessible or not well and and uh, uh because I'm, i want to bring in the voice of the the assembly member who really kind of uh is championing the work at the state level um but before i bring her on i, I want to ask you in terms of of this kind of national review what what's the role of a city uh, and the state non-federal government agencies and partners to to really kind of push this forward and 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 um, just giving you the opportunity to kind of uh, put accountability on us right now uh, as you have an audience. Well, I think the the big thing you do is you tell the stories that the national government claims to not know about and it's really important in the immigration space to tell the stories. I mean, Cesar has an incredible story. And when he tells a story, people realize that the federal government wasn't paying any attention and they didn't know that this was a happening and they didn't understand what was going on. And, uh, you know, New York City was a tremendous source of recruits when I was running the MAVNI program. Hundreds and hundreds of extraordinarily highly qualified immigrants flowed into the armed forces yeah. during that brief window of time. And they were an incredible asset to this country. And yet you don't hear that at all. All you hear from the federal government is, oh, they're dangerous, you know, they're a national security threat, you know, and you say, well, point to a, one of them that's a national security threat and they can't find one, you know. But telling the positive stories is really, really important. And that comes from the local level. And then also pressuring the national government. I mean, you can't fix, New York City Council can't fix the problems with the naturalization process. Right. But you can say, hey, we're sitting here in New York and we're looking at 26 Federal Plaza and I've got a constituent who's been trying for two and a half years to get citizenship and he's Chinese and he's two blocks away from a big monument to Chinese Americans who served in the military, which I'm sure you've all seen, mm -hmm. you know, and it's only a couple blocks from 26 Federal Plaza and yet the feds are preventing this guy from following in the footsteps of the people that are honored on that monument because, you know, he's Chinese and they're afraid of Chinese people these days, you know. And so telling the local story and pressuring the national government with your local stories is a critical part of advocacy and change because they seriously don't know what's going on up there in Washington. I think they're completely out of touch and they don't want to hear unless you have a story that you can illustrate. You know, they just don't. I mean, they're literally claiming that there's, you know, because we don't collect data on it. We don't know how many people there are, you know, and they, and they don't right. tell you that that's their own fault because they're not collecting the data. Right. Right. And that and that's where I want to bring in the assembly member for a minute. Um, and I know she has a busy day. So we're really, really thankful. And it's very key that we hear from her uh, about her bill and really making the connection. And I think we are committed at the city level. And I think this is really important that we're having this conversation um, at the city level, but the state level in data collection 
And I just want to give her the opportunity right now to, to connect to anything that you just said in terms of how New York state, city and state can work together on a federal agenda to change that. Uh, uh, Assemblymember Cruz. Mute me. Oh, there oh, we go. I was, I was still muted. I was okay. still muted. Uh, <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, look, I think one of the most important things we have to do as city and state, or at least the most basic thing, is allocate some funding to do to do just that. Figuring out who and, and who are these veterans, what do they need from us? It's something so basic that we should know. The fact that we think they should be coming to us to get the services is a little bit outrageous and frankly embarrassing. Um, mm -hmm. We at, 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 through the bill, we're actually going to look to allocate approximately $300,000 to make sure that this isn't an unfunded mandate, that this is an actual a piece of a um, state office that can do the, the, the data collection, that can do the delivery of services and the connecting of whatever services they don't get for these families. And I think that they can easily replicate something like this um, where you're dedicating a couple of staffers or even an office to advocating for the rights of these veteran immigrants. It's not a heavy lift, it's not rocket science. science. If we can find money to do um, a lot of other things, we can find money for immigrant veterans. It's not gonna take a lot. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. And, and I think we're, we're, we're on the same page and even though we're at different levels of government, I think you're gonna see uh, the council push, especially in these last few months uh, with the new council. And I wanna just publicly uh, commit to ensuring that that happens in a very real way. So thank you assembly member uh, for that. Uh, and that review, and I, and maybe the last question I want to, I want to really give, um, I want to come back to uh, the service members, uh, Yesenia and Caesar, who I think gave us very particular kind of journeys that they took to make their decision to serve, and so much sacrifice is part of that, um, and and really the the kind of barriers, and so I want to just give them both an opportunity to talk. And, and very specifically talk about some of the most important barriers that city agencies can do right now in the city of New York to change that relationship. Um, and maybe we'll start with Yesenia first. Thank you, Councilman Menchaca. I, I, I decided to serve because I always wanted to serve my country. That is, my, my parents always installed in me the to, to always um, serve our community um, and, and to be there for the community. And one of the, the things uh, with me, I decided to go in the enlisted route. Um, when you have a certain level of education, let's just say I, I have a master's degree, I could have gone the OCS route, the officer route. But one of the things I decided to do was I wanted to go into the enlisted route. I wanted to start off with the soldiers. I wanted to see what the soldiers were going through. And one of the most important things also, I wanted to know why were veterans being deported, right? So through that process, when I went into basic training, um, it was very interesting to see how I met many soldiers who just recently became U.S. citizens, and and they said it, I, that they that they enlisted because they always wanted to serve. It was during that that process, me being an enlisted member of the U.S. Army Reserve, that I met many soldiers who 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 were green card holders. Currently, even in my unit, I have many um, many soldiers who are going through this process uh, as well. They reach out to me confidentially, right? And they say, hey, Yesenia, I know you, you, you do this type of work where you help people who are, a, 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 you, you run an immigrant rights organization. I know your husband's story. Look, I have a similar story. Or they say that they're they're that they're trying to to protect their family as well because they're either their spouse or their 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 mothers or fathers are undocumented, right? So this is happening. They are there. It's just that there's not a proper channel right now that can really reach out to them or conduct outreaching, right? But um, I think it's really important how we're also talking about the veteran side, how there has been veterans who have been deported, but also soldiers who are enlisting, right? There's um, about 5,000 a, a green card um, individuals enlist in the, in, the, in the armed forces each year, right? So it, the fact that we don't know how many are enlisted in, in enlisting from New York or, or how many currently are, are serving, right? It's, 
it's a bit it, it's problematic it's problematic so uh with that being said it's working closely like reaching out to margaret stock she she's amazing she she has um uh, she has um, a lot of people that she is currently working with i know like cesar has a lot of soldiers that he's currently working with as well and as for myself that just reach out to the soldiers reach out to the units they're there but again there's not really a proper channel that conducts our reaching to the soldiers. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I, I don't know if there's any press that's listening to this right now, but this is just so, um, this really exposes the nature of humanity here, playing a role, uh, filling the gaps of city agencies that um, a city, state and federal, and, and it is your heart that is uh, the magnet to space that is full of trust and with that, so much can happen. And it just happens that you're a leader in Staten Island doing good immigrant uh, advocacy work. And, and that, that can't be how this, this happens, but it is how it's happening now. So we wanna say thank you uh, for that extra work that you're doing to really ensure that everybody gets justice. Um, but uh, it just continues to expose the nature of, of what we're talking about here. So I wanna say thank you for, for that, that commitment, that extra commitment uh, and, and on top of your service, uh, Caesar, And then I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Chair Dinowitz. Uh, Caesar, I think you're, you are muted. I'm good, I, I got, uh, thank you chairs. I uh, really appreciate the time. And in terms of like what concrete steps, uh, as Assembly moment, woman Catalina Cruz mentioned, we don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. Right now, we have an opportunity to work together uh, with COCO, with uh, with DBS, with Moya. We have resources here. Um, it's about us working together. And most importantly, I think right now, while we're having this hearing, uh, so thank you both chairs for really holding this in because this is the first step to really ensuring that government has uh, acknowledges that there is a, there's an issue, acknowledges that we need to have a public conversation about non-citizen service members and immigrant military families. So today is a big step of what we we're going to do. And, and in terms of second steps is really what uh, if, if we can, if we can have 500, if we can have money to pay some city, reluctant city workers uh, $500 to take the vaccine, I'm sure we can have funding to ensure that we can have resources for, for service members and their families to tap into legal services, mental health services, and to provide the resources to DBS and Moya to outreach to those communities that at times don't feel that they can turn to. Uh, the websites themselves, sometimes it, if, you, if you visit the, the DBS website, the Moya website, uh, when it comes to on DBS, it doesn't really particularly focus on immigrant services uh, for for non citizens or even Moya, it doesn't talk about uh, military. Uh, so it's really it's the welcoming. How do we welcome this uh, service members into to know, to let them know that government is here to support them? Uh, and as as Councilman Chuck, I think you've been a champion of language access. We have non citizen veterans who, as as Councilmember Chin mentioned, who don't speak English, uh, who or or who have limited English ability. So we also need to get into those uh, into the ethnic media and really provide those resources on that. And last, I want to actually want to show this uh, this poster um, about a little bit about we. I visited Tijuana, and there's this is they call this the bunker, and this is a, this is soldiers who veterans who have been deported. Uh, two of them are from New York City. Uh, and right now they're in limbo, as Coco mentioned. Uh, many of them are in New York City, some who are fortunate, while most of them are banished by their own country. And this is unacceptable. And right now they are they're asking not just from the federal government for help, but they're asking from their local government for help, for support, to really let them know that the city has their back, their, their own neighborhood can have their back. So for me, I am committed to working with with incredible, with incredible uh, public servants, 
uh, and Margaret and Assembly of Cartagena Cruz and Jesenia and Coco, we have, we're, we're here to support our government partners. And this is about working together and making sure that we can together create uh, concrete data so we can do the outreach necessary and ultimately to really provide these services so people can become citizens, people can get their uh, VA benefits, people can get mental health services that they need for our service members. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Caesar, again, for your service uh, as a public servant and, and military service as well. Uh, very powerful, uh, not just your testimony, but everything that you're doing right now. Um, and I want to just give the opportunity really quick to the assistant commissioner, uh, DBS. Uh, are, are you aware of those two um, uh, deported New Yorkers that are are seeking services. Is that something that's on your radar? We can unmute you. So, no, thank you, uh, Chair. So, no, uh, I'm not aware of those. Uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, work with CSI and, you know, anyone who has uh, intimate details of, of their current situation, you know, try to uh, assist them with, with their needs. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. And and I will join you on that. And I, I'm sure Chair Dinowitz as well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so let's, let's, let's make that, make that connection. Uh, and with that, I will pause and hand it over to uh, Chair Dinowitz. Thank you, Chair Menchaka, and thank you. I want to make sure I get the, the ranks correct. Lieutenant Colonel Stock, Corporal Vargas, and Specialist Mata, not only for your service, but as uh, Specialist Mata, Mata said, the, the sacrifices in the service of your family members, your friends, and, and your loved ones. Um, so... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stock um, spoke about in, in, in her own world, she's dealing with immigrant foreign born veterans. And this goes back to the kind of the same things we were taught, we've been talking about for a couple hours now. I'm interested to know what the communication is uh, between DVS and these and, and the lawyers and the nonprofits and the and the providers is is there communication between the work that that you all do because it's you know we're all here for our veterans specifically today of course our foreign born veterans we all want the same thing I assume we all want the same thing so so what is that communication like and I guess I'll ask uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stock what, what kind of communication exists there. Uh Unfortunately, the only communication I think I've had with um, DVS is occasionally when I've come to give a seminar on how to help immigrant veterans in New York. There's been somebody from DVS in the audience. So I, th well, it's good that, you know, I always look for the positive. It is good right. that they <laughs> showed up. Um, but this just seems like an incredible opportunity to do the thing that we are having trouble doing, which is identifying foreign born veterans. And it seems that you have this incredible resource, not, not only in Lieutenant Colonel Stock's organization, but in, uh, I don't know how many there are throughout the city or the state. Um, and I don't know if you have a list of these organizations or contacts, but it may be worth it for someone at DVS and Moya to actually do proactive outreach. You know, we've been talking a lot about different ways to identify people, do proactive outreach. This seems like an incredible opportunity to identify um, the foreign-born uh, veterans, because even if they're dealing with struggles regard, you know, around immigration, they may not know. Um, DVS serves everyone. New York City DVS, to your credit, serves everyone, regardless, or they're supposed to. I see, it here. I see Lieutenant Colonel Stock's hand up. They're supposed to serve everyone, regardless of immigration status and discharge status. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel? So I just wanted to mention, I don't want to dump on D DBS, but the uh, National VA just recently discovered there were immigration issues with veterans. <laughs> so don't feel bad. Um, literally in the last six months, they suddenly woke up and said, oh my God, we have immigrant veterans and the VA hasn't been serving them. And so now there's a new initiative Dennis McDonough, the secretary of the VA has started an initiative to try to bring services to the VA. So the national VA is, wasn't really tracking this issue at all. And I think DVS was actually tracking it more than they were. Um, so I did wanna just 
throw that out there for you. But the, the national VA is now sending people to training and trying to get classes and asking for input from immigrant veterans and that sort of thing, but they weren't doing it until about six months ago. Good. I mean, it's good that steps are being uh, <laughs> taken forward. Uh, so just to reiterate, this is a, you know, an incredible, I, I know um, uh, DVS is sort of a smaller agency compared with a lot of the other agencies. Um, but again, there's already incredible work being done on behalf of our immigrant veterans. And you can uh, I really urge you to, to work together with um, organizations that are already um, already doing, you know, doing the work. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, any further, uh, I don't have any further questions. I want to go back to Chairman Chuck or any other council member uh, who may have something else to add. I'm just going to pause here quickly and ask if any other council members have questions at this time. We're not seeing any other hands. Um, we also, this was our final um, public panel. So I also just wanted to ask if we have inadvertently missed anyone that registered to testify today and has yet to be called. You could use a Zoom raise hand function now um, and I will call in you in the order in which you're, you have raised your hands. Okay, just confirming we have no further testimony. So I'll turn it back to Chairman Taka. Uh, thank you. And I want to, again, thank the Assistant Commissioner and the Director um, for staying on and really engaging us. Um, for final remarks, uh, Chair Dinowitz, you want to make some final remarks and then I'll close us off? Sure. I, I just want to uh, thank, first, my co-chair for this meeting, Chair Menchaca, who um, I know is deeply committed to, um, to our immigrant community communities here in New York and, uh, and beyond, um, and centers a lot of his work on, on his heart. It's, it's, it's who he is on the inside. And I deeply trust that he wants to better the lives of our immigrant brothers and sisters, our neighbors. Um, and I, and I want to thank, of course, the committee staff, uh, our panelists, Lieutenant Colonel Stock, Corporal Vargas, Specialist Mata, um, Assembly Member Cruz and Coco Coolhane, um, DVS, and, and Moya for coming and, and for answering questions, uh, but also engaging in a conversation. You know, regardless of whether or not everything is going perfectly, we know there's more work to do. Uh, and I believe that our city agencies want to do that work, want to better the lives of our foreign born veterans. Um, I look forward to continued conversations and continued work um, between myself, the chair, other stakeholders and the city agencies. Um, and I think today we, we uncovered a lot of important information, but also um, reached a lot of important conclusions as to, as to ways we can move forward to really ensure that our foreign born veterans are getting the support and care that not only they need, but have earned. I think maybe, maybe more than many other groups, you know, wearing that uniform and literally putting your life on the line for a country in which you were not born. I, I don't know if there's a, you know, a better sign of patriotism than that. So I look forward to continued conversations, continued work to make sure our foreign born veterans get the support that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Dinowitz. And I will join you in all the thank yous to those who made today's uh, historic moment uh, powerful and hopefully has moved they have moved all of us to action and we we cannot waste time. Uh, I know that there's a lot of transition right now in the city council and in the state even and the city, um, but those, those conditions um, should not remove us from our commitment to veterans who are serving today or have served and those family members that are connected to those service members. Uh, and I'm just super, um, uh, grateful to always listen with incredible um, and, and, and powerful testimony that that have very specific things that we can do as a city. Uh, we can't change federal law, but we can change our relationship with people in our neighborhoods. And that is the most powerful thing that we can do. You heard it 
right here that there are relationships being formed between the soldiers and that is how they're getting access to services and rethinking how government can help them as they move through the citizenship process. They are that is a, a right that they have. This is not something that we're giving them um, as a as as a throwaway um, thing. This is this is the right that they have as they serve. Uh, and so everything that that was 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 kind of presented. I want to hold. And before we leave uh, and transition the city council, I want to work with Chair Dinowitz on a report after after this hearing to really, uh, in a concrete way, work on these issues. Um, and then finally, what I what I want to say is that the leadership here that was lacking, we 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 did not have the the commissioners. Um, I'm I just want confirmation that that you're all going to talk to the commissioners and then that we can bring them in on a call uh, that the chair and I can lead with staff about post hearing results. Um, and if that's possible, I think we're going to be, be able to make some some headway now uh, and really change the relationship. Uh, that's where it starts. And when we have good relationship, we have good outcomes. Uh, when we can start uh, taking data and information, we can keep ourselves accountable. That's what's driving this. Uh, and so thank you. Uh, thank you to the staff and, uh, and a special thank you to Cesar Vargas um, and Yesenia uh, Mata, who have been doing incredible work on the ground, uh, not just for the city of New York, but um, for our immigrant communities. Thank you all. Uh, and with that, I will close this hearing.